So, hey, Vaseem Anwar, how is the life treating you? Uh, very well, Alhamdulillah, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, and uh, thank you for you know, asking me to have this conversation with you. Uh, life's been going quite well, I think, uh, in this uh, COVID-19, although I understand that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, pressure on people's head about, like, what's the situation like, but trying to keep pushing and just trying to keep moving ahead. Yeah. Walaikum salam. And Ramadan Kareem, how's Ramadan going in quarantine especially? I think uh, Ramadan is, uh, again, like, you know, it's just, like, it's just... Uh, mended into our routine of working from home so it wasn't like you know in fact i think this is one of the easiest ramzan i would say because uh we we aren't like you know going out when we aren't like putting ourselves or physically exerting ourselves too much so i think it's actually quite easy like you know because our schedule is kindly kind of in our own hands although we're doing these uh zoom meetings and all this uh, stuff going on but like in most on most times of the day, we have our own schedule. So I pretty much feel that it's like one of the easiest Ramadans going, Alhamdulillah, like, you know, it's just going on. By the way, uh, before we continue, I mean, I would again, on the record, like to congratulate you on getting your PhD. I think it's one of uh, a really great feat that you've achieved uh, to you and to your family. So congratulations on getting that. Thank you, you know, so much. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good feeling. Uh, and, and, um, yeah, it's 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 a relief too. So you spent so many years, and finally you're done. So yep, I'm very thankful. Now, so hey, before I move on, I need to tell everybody who's listening that why am I so fond of you? So Sohib has been in touch with me since 2010 or 11. When did I teach? Yeah, I think uh, I think you started teaching us back in 2010. I, uh, we we took this course of uh, pro pro construction project management with you. That was back in 2010, 11-ish. Uh, but before that, I must confess that, you know, we knew you back before that then as well, right? Uh, my uh, my, my uh, batchmates and I used to follow a lot of your videos back then when you were, you know, making those interesting videos, which kind of, kind of inspired us in a way that, you know, in an environment where there's a lot of technical stuff uh, being talked about this something that's like you know creative being done so we we had like you know i think the pre kind of a moment before as well yeah those were fun times thank you for remembering so hey but i think it's time to forget them now <laughs> <laughs> no they were fun, fun times and i i really cherish them now i taught um so hey here so officially i'm his teacher but to be true, I've learned more things from him than he might have learned from me because he is such an inspiration because he's always positive. He's always uh, uh, thinking for a valuable addition to society, to the industry, whatever he's working on. And he also is very conscious about his physical health. So I've seen him playing tennis and running and just doing everything around. I mean, so multitasking might be one of the things that you've inspired me for. I always thought that you can do only one thing and one thing only if you want to do it right. But you have been doing all those things and doing them right all the time. So how did you do that, Zuhib? Uh First of all, thank you, for Zandri, for I mean, for a very great compliment. Uh, I think, especially coming from you, since you yourself are very quite versatile. And I, to be honest, I greatly get inspired by a lot of the work that you do, you do like, you know, kind of like having your own personal space. Uh, I think for me, what kind of inspires me is I've always been fond of having balance in life. Like, you know, I think something that, in, in, you know, uh, has existed uh, instinctively in me has been how not to get inclined towards too much. Uh, fundamentally, I think one of the instinctive drive in me has been like uh, to have balance in life. And when I kind of think that way, I try and convert that more practically how I want to have a good day for myself. I never like indulging in something too much for too long that I start forgetting about other things because I feel that, you know, your life uh, is a multifaceted, uh, you know, uh, 
thing. It, it's not just one element. Yes, in certain moments, you may have to give priority to certain things, but overall, you should try and have flavors of so many different things. Because if you have not done that, I, I just feel you're missing out on a larger picture. So that, that you know, urge or drive to have balance, and then also that urge and drive to try and test new things are kind of two things that have really pushed me towards, you know, having that balance around. And that's why, like, you know, you, you mentioned me trying to be physically active at times, uh, and then also trying to, like, you know, do something with, related to my professional development or, like, you know, personal development. I, I personally feel that, you know, it's, it's all about trying to get that balance in your uh, personal life and personal space. Cool. You know, the last proper sports I played was a very strategic game called Kedi Kedi. <laughs> like I, my point is I've never, I've never been into sports and I now kind of regret that because it's fun and it's value at the same time. Um, but more than that, being more knowledgeable about your anatomy, what your body requires, what your mind requires is something that I think we miss as a society. And yes. you have been contemplating a lot on that lately, right? I think, I think, yes. I mean, just recently what I concluded, I mean, this past few months or so when I've been sitting at home and kind of just like, you know, uh, thinking about uh, how to stay positive during these times, because uh, I've been, I've been playing tennis for over a decade now. And I've been uh, uh, like, you know, also like, you know, in, in parallel to that, I've been, uh, continuing with my studies and then I went abroad for my master's, came back, didn't, started working for WWF, uh, doing all the projects and stuff. Uh, I was going with the flow. I mean, as things were coming, yes, I was investing, I was pushing myself, but at the same time, things were coming to me. Just recently, this past one month, when everything has been put on lockdown, when nothing is entering your space, it's you, you that you have, I felt that I have to push extra mile. Uh, it's very easy to lock yourself down. But then, yes, lock. So there's a difference between locking yourself uh, to protect, but then also you have to avoid locking yourself mentally and physically so not to get bogged down and not to enter into that negative space. So what I, I kind of, one thing that I, I was able to rationalize during this period was differentiating between these two, two types of lockdowns. Uh, yes, we all have to lock down to stay safe, to protect ourselves, but we do not have to lock down at the same time to uh, like, you know, put ourselves into that negative space. So I kind of learned about that and something that I contemplated over, over, the, over this period of time and uh, tried pushing myself a bit. So I've had developed this, you know, exercise regime during this time as well, where I've been like, you know, just going uh, to the park that's just nearby. It's, most of the time it's awake and just having a lap around, coming back, doing some exercises. And then at the same time, spending time with my daughter, um, also doing some readings, doing some online courses, uh, actually learning a lot of cooking, to be honest, like, you know, something that I've found as a new passion for me and something that I'm probably going to continue for a while that, you know, the taste that I've started exploring, like, you know, just experimenting in the kitchen and all, mm -hmm. something that kind of, made me realize that you know even within the lockdown you if you try and push yourself uh, you 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 should do that and not let yourself enter into that negative space because it's very easy and it's very uh, at times tempting as well to start thinking negatively but it it's not helpful i think it's just probably uh, it, some sometimes it becomes difficult to then pull yourself out of out of that as well so that is something that, you know, something I've been really, uh, uh, I think something I've discovered lately. And I hope that uh, maybe just like, you know, talking to you and maybe this message, if it goes out to people, it's, it's about like, you know, keeping yourself uh, focused and positive, uh, even during lockdown, because uh, life is not going to end and it's not going to, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, it's your, you who can, put yourself in a mental lockdown. So don't do that, I think. Cool. You know, I, I didn't experience cooking um, and I did it 
recently. The reason I didn't experience cooking, even though I've been living here for five years now, is that my wife and I, we had divided our chores. So she was mm -hmm. all about cooking. I was all about dishes and cleaning, um, yeah. which I liked because it, it was not a mind stressing work and you didn't expect <laughs> anybody to criticize your output. It's never perfect. So it's, it's a vicious cycle though, which is another story. But I also experimented with cooking recently and mm -hmm. interestingly, I liked it too. Though I thought that I would be pathetic at it and I'm not that good too, but still it's a, it's a very calming experience. You get a lot of uh, peace out of it, right? It, it is like, you know, for me, it was like, uh, uh, like, you know, I, I felt like, you know, we have all these senses, like, you know, I'm physically exerting myself. So why am I depriving myself of all these tastes around? So I, when I went to the kitchen, being a science student, I felt like, like going into a chemistry lab, putting things in the pot, trying to experiment with taste and something was coming out. Initially it was disaster, obviously, like, you know, people didn't like it, uh, especially my mom and she was like, you know, uh, really expert in cooking and my wife as well. Like, you know, they both have this uh, niche, but then I kind of, tried pushing myself into it um, and at the end of the day one reason I also felt like you know why do uh, as a as a you know why do women have to take that responsibility I think just like considering that you know it's it's an equal responsibility we all have uh, appetites for eating right so we should all so all like contribute towards making good food as well so it's both ways I think and another thing I realized so it was that um, Perhaps you didn't experience that because you have been lucky to live at home. But here, um, as my wife and I were both students, we used to eat out a lot. And we were yep. starting to get used to it. But when we rediscovered the house food for all three meals, it was mm. amazing. It was a, re a resurrection. It was such a homely feely feeling. So that's exactly. too... And, uh exactly i mean you're absolutely right and i think one thing i realized doing that and you're, you're absolutely right like you know kitchen i suppose is the heart of your house exactly if you can if you can like you know populate your kitchen and make it uh, the centerpiece of it your house becomes like a home because you know everyone loves coming into it and you know one thing I'm and, and inshallah when you're back as well i think one thing we should probably do together is like you know do these barbecues and like, you know, I mean, in America, one thing I missed in Pakistan when I initially came back because America is all about like, you know, barbecues and all that, especially during the summer times. So I think we should probably have a fun barbecue uh, session at one of our places as well. I'll come there wherever the food is. So, uh -huh. so that's a, that's a done thing. Let's do that. Okay. Shifting yes. gears here. So yes. let's come to yeah. your, um, work and your discipline and before that uh, let's quickly revise your credentials here you have two masters right after your environmental engineering you did a master's from england if i'm not wrong and then yes, one so I, in the u.s on fulbright yes so i graduated from uet you know that like back in 2012 right after i went to uk uh, i went to university of surrey to do my master's in it's a unique degree, it's uh, in corporate environmental management. Uh, during that time, I, I consider myself lucky to get Fulbright scholarship because I had applied for it before I, I had applied to for England, but it takes, you know, it takes more time for the scholarship to get processed. So while I was completing my master's in UK, I got a call that I've also been awarded a Fulbright scholarship. So I completed my master's because I was just about on the verge of doing that. Completed my master's from UK and then went to US for another master's. And that was from State University of New York. In, uh, and my master's was in environmental resource engineering. So yeah, I did those and then came back in 2015, early 2015. And since then, I've been working with WWF uh, in their freshwater program. So water has has always been a concern, but only recently in Pakistan, we have started realizing that we're running out of it and we're running out of it very quickly, right? Yes, 
uh one thing though i would i would like to clarify here uh and it's it's a because it's a very uh huge misconception it's not we're not running out of water mm -hmm. we're losing access to it and there's a difference between the two so water in nature has always been the same it's always present and even in if you look at countries like pakistan who are like you know quite vulnerable to water stresses uh in in our natural capacity we have a lot of water in our reserves it's how we are able to access it that's the issue so it it kind of boils down to the management and the governance of our water resources that is causing the problem for us right now yeah so i remember as kids we used to drink tap water in lahore do you remember that yeah yes and yes. when i when I came here to michigan everybody was drinking tap water here and that was yeah. a nostalgia that i it was it stuck me like what have we done to our reservoirs and yes. underwater um aquifers that we have polluted them so much why did I that mean, happen to him and and is there any hope i think you you like you vast a very very interesting and a very important question here because i also thought about it very deeply and since i've been working around this field uh i got to kind of uh, kind of investigate a deeper uh, in a more deeper detail about like why has this happened uh very interestingly i think uh one of the reasons i would say this happened is because we did not we haven't valued water as a resource and by value i don't mean that like, you know just praising it as a very important element valuing means we haven't properly managed it we haven't pro put up proper protocols to manage it one of the one of the ways to manage and value water is by measuring it properly measuring its consumptions uh, and also paying for the price that it costs us water is not a free commodity i think we should get this very straight that uh, a lot of people think it's a free resource it is not like any other resource in the world it from its, its extraction to its delivery the whole supply chain has a cost we should understand the cost every consumer should understand and you very rightly mentioned i mean i i in pakistan i was very little when we used to have tap waters running in our houses and we used to drink from it but those are mostly stories that i've heard from my granddads and from my grandparents that you know we used to go and use the hand pump and drink right from the source or just like open the taps we the because we did not manage our infrastructures because we did not pay its due price what has happened is that 30 40 years down the road we have ended paying more uh to the private bottling companies so what has happened is there has been a shift we kind of lost our uh value we did not value water properly and at the end of the day we have ended paying uh to the private companies and we considered okay i mean for us it's okay like you know we were we're getting water had we paid for the same water back then our utility companies would have been able to sustain better they would have been able to continue the services like i mean look at vasa they i won't blame them they're trying their best i don't know to the best of their abilities to keep their water sources and their services running but uh, i mean our utility services are very poor in terms of management right uh, i mean you talked about michigan i i'm sure the michigan state and its water utility services are, would be one of the one of the best in the world i mean their entire infrastructure from extracting water to service delivery to your tell your households would be very optimal and they'll be upgrading their infrastructure and technologies that requires investment and we haven't to be honest uh given it due consideration and that is why we've lost our access to it you know what truly saddens me is to is to observe the behaviors we have you know there's a lot of sociological and psychological factors involved here in michigan if you look at the map of michigan it's surrounded by the great lakes and the great lakes have 25% of all fresh water in the world yeah surface fresh water to be precise yeah so they have enough water for centuries to come but mm -hmm. still i find people being careful while using it 
And back yes. home, yes. we have been so reckless. I mean, we have been, to be true, stupid using it. Yeah. And that really, that really brings me to the social side of it. In your work and in your experience, what do you think is the solution to human behavior in this regard? Is it I education? Think, is it awareness campaigns? What do you think? I think it's uh, both. I think you're, again, you know, social responsibility to conserving water is a huge aspect. It's a very important element that we need to play. Uh, but in Pakistan, uh, you can see variations in it. Like if you travel from north to south, if uh, I've, lately I've been traveling quite frequently from Lahore to Karachi, you see a great shift in mindset. People in Lahore, the way they use water is very different from the way people in Karachi use. Because in Karachi, people are already hit very hard because of water shortages. And there in Karachi, they are paying very high prices for the water they are procuring from the tankers that come every week or bi-weekly to their houses. So it's, it's again all about how privileged you are as a society, but then you're right, we need to educate people that no matter how privileged you are, no matter how much access to you, you have for water, you still need to conserve it. I think it's a behavioral change that we need to bring. It's a, a mindset shift that we need to bring. And that can come through education, that can come through creating awareness among all groups and sects of society. Uh, they also, I think with, with respect to water, I also think it's part of our religious responsibility as well. If I bring in our religious context that, you know, we have to conserve water. Uh, I remember I recently read one of Prophet Muhammad's saying that, you know, you should save water even if you're standing near a running stream. So it means, what it means is, okay, even if there is abundance of water available to you, you should still conserve it. He has laid great emphasis on the need for conserving water. So we should all understand that. Uh, unfortunately, our society has become a little reckless in terms of their behavior. Uh, they, I, I feel that, you know, we need to do a lot of <laughs> learning, self-education, and then, you know, I'm kind of doing that uh, and imparting that knowledge outside to others as well. Right. You know, this is one of the areas I'm, I'm truly interested in, how to convince people. And one of the conclusions that I've drawn is through my years of trainings and then learning about leadership that it's way easier to influence people when they are at their younger ages. Like it's easier to put the seed in the kid's mind rather than going and yeah. convincing the grown-ups who will listen to you, pretend like they're understanding, pretend that they, pre pretending like they care, but at the end of the day, you don't end up having that value. So perhaps that's the newer generations is where we need to target it. And again, it saddens me to learn that still there are so many pe um, kids out of school in Pakistan and still would don't have the basic education right. So a lot of work there. And a lot, again, a lot of cannot... work, but... Okay, Sorry. go on. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to say like, you know, again, like uh, younger generation to me, I think is more uh, creative. They're more understandable and you're right. They, they pick things up very quickly as well. I mean, lately I've been uh, just, just on the fun side of it. I. WWF does a lot of work with uh, schools, uh, you know, environmental education. So I was like, I, I, I was a, a panelist in one of the uh, environmental competitions that we had lately. And so they were like, you know, they're different uh, uh, groups uh, from different schools that had these very interesting projects. Uh, they made these documentaries about different uh, environmental issues happening around in Lahore city. Some covered solid waste, others covered air pollution and then water crisis. And all of them actually came up with really good solutions, very affordable and practical solutions. And I felt like, you know, happy that at least our younger generation is thinking about these issues rather than discouraging them, rather than putting them off, off the, uh, you know, pathway by telling them that this is not practical enough. I think we should encourage them.
hopeful. I hope we have more. What's that uh, girl from Sweden's name? And Greta? Uh, Greta. Yeah, yeah, Greta Thunberg. Yeah. We have some Gretas popping up in our in our society as well. Yes, there are a lot actually. There are a lot many. We just need to identify them and exactly. then bring yeah. them empowering bring them to the right. Yes, yes, yes. So, Sohib, it was wonderful catching up. I feel so happy that you're doing wonderfully. You're actually making valuable use of this time in quarantine, which I clearly am not. So, again, thank you for inspiring and have no, a thank wonderful Thank you so much. I think I'm just trying to do whatever I can think of, actually. It's just like, you know, nothing special, just trying to, uh, just trying to do whatever I can uh, to, to like, you know, keep pushing because I know that eventually it's going to go away and then we're going to return back to normal lives, inshallah, very soon. Uh, but till then, I mean, there shouldn't be too long of that depressing time. I just, I just don't enjoy that negative space. So just, just kind of running away from that. Great. Just stay the same, Suhaib. Stay the same amazing Suhaib that we all know. And I look forward to see you when I'm back home. Thank you. Inshallah. Hope to see you and all the best. Uh, take care. Okay. Bye-bye.